formally, I want to welcome everyone to our panel and our Zoom room. <clears throat> um, we have before you three panelists. Uh, Liza Kerwin is the interim director of the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. She has helped to establish the archives exhibition and publications program, having curated well over 30 archival exhibitions and has written extensively on historical value and immediacy of primary sources. We also have Ariane Edmonds. She's a fifth generation Angelino and founder of the JL Edmonds Project. It is an initiative dedicated to preserving the legacy of the Liberator newspaper and Black Angelino history and culture. Ariane has curated exhibitions and produced public programs about early 20th century Black history, journalism, genealogy, memory, and legacy for many institutions. Currently, she is one of the new commissioners of the Los Angeles Public Library and has worked with Suzanne M on many projects. Um, and then JL Edmonds is Ariane Edmonds' great great grandfather, who was the editor of The Liberator, the early 20th century Los Angeles news magazine for the African American community. Suzanne M is the acting senior librarian, digitization and special collections at the Los Angeles Public Library. Some of you may have heard Suzanne recently on KCRW discussing how history will remember COVID-19 and the Los Angeles Public Library's creation of a coronavirus time capsule. Um, her job is to ensure that staff training resources and processes are in place to provide reference, cataloging, and metadata services for special collections material, as well as prioritizing items for digitization projects. I'm having trouble with that word, so I'm just, I'm glad I was able to say it. Um, Suzanne has established the Memory Lab programs at the Los Angeles Public Library, which aims to bring personal archiving and digital preservation tools and skills to community members. She is currently a Andrew W. Mellon Fellow for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage with the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. So um, just to get us started, one of the first general questions that I have is that we, we ask these three individuals specifically because they have a knowledge on organizing archives from a national city and individual level. So what are the similarities and what do you each find most challenging and exciting about archiving and legacy building? How about if we have Lisa go first? Sure. Thanks, Christina. Thanks for putting this panel together. Um, I think one of the things that kind of keeps us awake at night is thinking about um, having a representative picture of the visual arts in the United States. And uh, since the archives was founded in 1954, the art world in the United States has grown astronomically. It's a lot more complex than it was back in the 50s. And so that's, that's one thing. Um, another is um, handling born digital material, how to acquire it, uh, assess it, um, transfer it, uh, maintain its integrity and store it on a secure server, how to make that material available to researchers in a uh, controlled way in a manuscript reading room is something that we and many other archives are grappling with those particular challenges. Uh, we collect all kinds of born digital material. Um, another area within that, it's not specific to born digital, but artists who work in um, digital media and determining various preliminary work that is distinct from finished works of art. We don't collect finished works of art, but we collect preliminary studies, sketches, plans. So uh, without the intervention of the artist to tell you this is a final work or this is one of 10 variations that I, I explored until I came upon this final work is something that is a very naughty problem for us as we move, as we move forward, especially in the digital age. How about you, Suzanne? 
Yeah, um, born digital materials um, are an area that is, that is an area that is new for us as well. Um, actually, the COVID-19 community archive um, that we started during the pandemic was our first really big foray into collecting born digital materials. And, um, you know, all of the issues that come with that, like, um, like we've had to limit the type of formats that we were willing to accept because we could only handle those specific formats. And we, we, we chose not to accept um, audiovisual materials because, um, you know, uh, given the scope, we knew we didn't have the capacity to collect that. Um, and for us, um, like for an organization our size, um, we, we're, we're, um, our department is small but mighty. Um, we have, <laughs> Um, you know, I think uh, human resources is definitely a challenge for us. We have um, currently six and a half FTE doing digitization and special collections work where, you know, in other institutions, um, digitization is a separate unit um, from uh, or, or like operates um, like with a separate team. Um, and so we're all doing it together. Um, and um, and yeah, for us uh, specifically at um, LAPL, the distribution of our special collections is a challenge for us um, because we have, you know, the photo collection, we have our map collection, we have our genealogy collection that are all dispersed um, in uh, the history department. So it's, you know, um, uh, these are some of the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. Ariane? Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting, for inviting me. I'm super excited to explore today. Um, I think some of the challenges around uh, keeping and preserving a family collection, which I, I kind of, I think a lot of our work is also um, around like community archiving, thinking through how um, the community gets to have access to our to our stories, to our history. Um, I think one of the most challenging pieces for for our family is we've been kind of collecting over. I guess this is, you know, you know, our collection. The beginning of our collection started like in the 1850s, so we have you know ephemera and photography and a lot of you know um, periodicals we have it's such a it's such a a, a big mix of different types of medium um, I think the challenge for us was really around um, making sure that folks knew what was important uh, to preserve um, and and also figuring out how something that was so precious to our family translating that um, uh, to like a, a city uh, wide, um, uh, like kind of translating that to make sure that the city understood that this is also a part of our LA history that needed to be included as part of our collective memory. Um, and that was kind of, I mean, I think most people feel like their families are special. And I, I think this probably translates for artists too, where they feel like their work is important, or at least I hope, you know, they hope that it is. Um, and so, you know, the challenge is kind of two swords, I think, it's, or two sides of the sword. There's like wanting to make sure that um, our history is preserved with integrity and that um, our story gets to be shared from our perspective. I think the other side is, I think, uh, folks, artists, family members may be not sure how important um, our work is, our story is. So um, that has been, and also I think us trying to find about the third, I said there was only two, but I'm adding one more. Um, the, the third was just uh, kind of navigating um, how we build alongside institutions. Because, you know, we've um, been collecting and preserving in our own way, the way that, you know, in, in the way that we think, you know, um, our, uh, our family history in LA should be preserved, but making sure that it's available to the public, so the public can understand, and then partnering with different organizations, different institutions, um, to make sure that there's uh, proper translation took some time, so... Those would be like our, our top ones. Um, so 
uh, one of the questions that we, I think a lot of people have on their mind is, and, and some of the, uh, our audience members are people who are actually involved with archiving, but um, on these multiple levels that you are all involved in, what does it take to build an archive from the simplest to the complex and how to know which, or how to, I mean, how, really how to know what to save and what to throw out or not throw out, but what to include in a legacy is something that we were thinking about. If you guys could all, if you would be willing to share your perspective on that. Well, I, um, I think um, what to save and what to throw out, we get that, we get that question quite a bit. And um, typically, I mean, we, we err on the side of a larger archive than a smaller one. And we actually prefer that people not do that kind of work or work with us through the collection so that we can better understand. Uh, as Adrian said, it's so important hearing from the creator of the collection what is important because you don't often know even in context what the meaning of something is and how important it is to that individual or what kind of meaning that that had. So typically it's just routine correspondence, printed material that is easy, easily available elsewhere, duplicates. I mean, artists have 500 exhibition cards or they used to, they don't send these any, any longer, but those kinds of things where you have multiple catalogs, often people want to give us uh, publications and if it, has an I, if it has an ISBN number and it can be cataloged at a library, we would much prefer that going to a library because it's much more easily accessible and would be cataloged as a monograph and available through interlibrary loan and other means. Whereas if it's embedded in, in someone's personal papers, it's not gonna be item cataloged and it, you know, it will you know, remain there. So we like to save those smaller publications that are not easily available elsewhere, not the monographs that are at the at libraries. And often we will take those from a donor with the understanding that we will transfer them to Smithsonian libraries and um, they can keep a record of what came. We keep the provenance of what came in with the collection, but we don't keep the books. So those kinds of easy answers, like right off the bat, we don't want, uh, for the most part, we don't want people's tax material unless it is a summation of studio expenses. We don't need everyone's telephone bills or their um, uh, household expenses, but those expenses related to studio materials and um, uh, you know related to their practice as an artist is what we're after. So there's a whole lot of stuff, boxes and boxes of of material that's put together for tax returns that people save and often save for you know, much longer than they need to, uh, we're also not interested in that. Of course, we don't take medical records. Um, we are very careful with um, personal, personal um, identification information like social security numbers and other things like that. We have to be very careful about taking that in and putting that in the public domain. So, um, but in general, uh, personal correspondence, sketchbooks, financial records, um, uh, unpublished writings. We don't take drafts of published writings unless the draft significant, is significantly different than what was published. And there are reasons for th that a researcher would want to consult the draft rather than the published work. The published work typically stands, you know, alone. So our historians often want to give us the galleys of their books, but uh, we're not going to save that unless there was a chapter that for one reason or another, they got into a, a difficulty with the editor, the publisher, and it wasn't published. So we have to find out those things that are unique to the record and also those things that have um, real research potential for uh, today and in the future. You know, I would add that I think it's so important to, to um, you know, when you are processing a collection to do it um, uh, 
together, right? So when you're we're working with a uh, special collections team and you're working with archivists and you're also working with the artists themselves or you know a family whoever whoever you know is responsible for this collection, you know um, we you know when I'm thinking about for our family paper, um, Jefferson who was the one who founded the paper kept all the pay, um, each issue, he put them in bound books. So we have all these volumes, but inside the, um, inside the, the uh, like the first cover, you see him like documenting how many pages are there um, and putting in just some little notes. And while that uh, was not something that was, you know, we actually, um, you know, everything was unbound when we did the digitization process, but, it was still an important piece to help inform the way that he created his uh, his newspaper, the way he approached his writing, the way he approached um, his like publishing practice. And so, um, just to build on what Elisa shared, I think that, um, or that Elisa shared, is that um, I think that uh, even though it may not make it to the final um, collection, it's still important to help paint a picture of who this person was, what they cared about. Um, and as long as uh, we're kind of capturing really kind of um, important moments in their life, um, I don't think anything is, um, is like fluff or that you don't need it. Yeah. Um, uh, and in our uh, Think Like an Archivist workshops, um, we um, tell people when they're going through their materials to ask themselves, does this item tell my story? Um, and um, question whether, is this something that's widely available? That's, you know, like Liza mentioned, something that can be checked out at a public library, in which case you probably don't need it because it's already being um, been indexed, uh, cataloged um, and made available elsewhere. And um, we do tell, um, and like as far as duplicates go, um, we tell people follow the rule of three. Um, and this applies whether um, you're talking about uh, paper based or um, analog materials or um, digital materials. Um, so the rule of three is basically um, you want to keep three copies of. Um, each item that's important to you. Like in that, this rule is taken from the IT community. Um, and so you want three copies um, in uh, two different geographic locations with one of them off site. Um, and that's to ensure that you have um, backups um, that you can access in the case, um, you know, a hard drive fails or a server fails or something like that. And then um, we just go ahead and apply that to um, like, if you have brochures from um, a show, you don't need 50 of them. You just can keep two to three of them um, as part of your archive. And I think um, by virtue of existing, you are creating an archive. Um, and I think people just need to start thinking them of themselves as citizen archivists and centering themselves as the archivists of their own experience. And, um, you know, um, like as an as an artist, um, you're you're constantly creating writers. They're you know constantly writing. First, uh, people and you know regular uh, persons are collecting, um, buying things, acquiring things, and all of these things accumulate, and they make up your archive. Um, and it's it's a matter of um, like thinking in terms of like where does your artistic practice align with our, you know, this archival practice. It's, it's a balance, like it's an art and a science. Um, you know, like if you're working with digital uh, media, um, you know, you want to make sure you save things in a certain re resolution, um, make sure you have naming conventions so that you can find them later on. Um, and, you know, um, you know, having inventories making a list of things um, um, to, to, to be sure that you can always find them later. Can you just uh, touch on a couple things there, a naming convention, <laughs> uh, that's new to me. And then also, can we talk a little bit about metadata? Yes, um, so uh, naming conventions, um, we, we talk about it more so uh, with, 
uh, regard to digital files, digital objects. Um, so um, you want, uh, you have, as an artist, you have a certain way of um, approaching your work, right? So um, you uh, may want to come up with a system uh, for um, saving all of your digital files. Um, uh, like, by um, there's a set of uh, naming conventions that's recommended by Stanford University Libraries that I usually present as part of our um, our uh, digital preservation basics workshop. Um, but um, essentially, you want to include things like date um, in 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 your file names. Um, you might want to have something like a descriptive um, title. Um, such as, you know, uh, uh, enter slowly exhibit <laughs> as, you know, to, um, uh, as applied to like a certain um, items that represent a certain event. Um, and then having, like, if there are multiple items that are coming out of that event, you, you'll want to have um, filing numbers, right? But don't just um, go one, two, three, four, five, um, because of the way computers read uh, file names, you'll need to have leading zeros so that um, you know those items are listed in the order that you want them to be. So include maybe three or four leading zeros, um, depending on like you know the number of objects that you have related to that series. Um, and what was the other part? Metadata. Well, yeah, I mean that's an interesting thing because as an as an artist, I you know like. I'll have sort of digital sketches, right? I'll kind of try and work out a composition on in Photoshop. And I just say like EG1, EG2, EG3. Um, so that that's a really interesting thing. But I think it's, as an artist on a practical level, that would ha absolutely happen once the project has closed. You know, that's a, like when you're in the thick of a project, you're just kind of, trying to understand what's important and what's like what files are are going to be are like what's the final file um but that's an interesting problem too and my other question was about meta metadata so what one of the things you just said was to put the date in the file name but the metadata on my photoshop files tells me the date it was created so does the metadata go away at some point? Um, it can be modified. Um, so, oh, I mean, I mean, particularly uh, when you're you're dealing with photos, um, you'll want to uh, include the date that that photo was taken, um, because like if you modify that file later on, it's going to have a different date from the you know the original photo date. Um, but yeah, metadata, um, XMP metadata, um, uh, there, there's a couple of different types. Uh, there's XMP metadata, which is a metadata that you can enter uh, manually on, into a file. And then there's um, IPTC uh, metadata, which is captured by machine, you know, like by a scanner or a camera or, a, a, you know, um, other device. Um, so those tend to be um, pretty stable um, unless, like, let's say, um, uh, you know, a lot of people, they might save their, um, their photos onto a social media platform, right? Um, and I mean, this is because, you know, I deal with more of a public audience, um, and that might be where they think they can store all of their their um, their work, their their photos, um, but once they download the photos from that social media site, that metadata is scrubbed. So that's why file names are really important, um, and we emphasize that um, you know coming up with a file naming convention that makes sense to you, and maybe writing up a document that explains how you came up with that file naming convention, so that you know someone you know the next person who um, <laughs> Uh, accesses your collection can understand it. You know, I feel like I. Oh, sorry. No, go. Okay. I um, I feel like I have a slightly more um, 
uh, like spiritual relationship with with metadata. I, I know that's such a sharp turn from like, you know, uh, <laughs> doing all of our digital files. But I, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, I was doing research for uh, a piece um, that I'm working on. Uh, and I was doing this research at the Pasadena Library, um, and it's on the John Brown collection. They're like a John Brown and Owen Brown are like this abolitionist family that moved to um, uh, Altadena. They were like, you know, freedom fighters and, you know, did all kinds of things. But the collection was processed by a family member because the name is in the information and the things that were included, like, talking about the time that he died, you know, um, oof, like uh, how many days, how many hours, the minutes, and the way that this, the sections, like each, um, each, you know, like, uh, like the finding aid is like, it's like poetry, and I've never seen anything like that. Um, and it, it, it made me think about what happens when we process collections um, by people who loved, um, uh, that person or, or, or loved, you know, um, or was committed to maybe like a spe specific, you know, social movement that, that is being processed, you know, or a collection um, or, or what it means to, um, uh, to be remembered um, and for that person to, to remember you. Uh, and so me as like a, a stranger, you know, almost 200 years later, seeing that this person really loved her uncle, um, and wanted to make sure that I knew that um, is something that I'll never forget. And I and that's something that's just in the description. And so when we think about artists and their process, I think including them uh, in the way that they describe their work um, is so crucial um, because I think we don't have a lot of that actually. Um, I, I did an exhibition right before uh, the pandemic came and got us all. It was called the Instant Archive. And I, I mostly based my shows around um, a text, like, a, a, like a, a piece of text. And so we focused this one on Robin Cost Lewis's um, uh, The Voyage of the Sable Venus, which she's this amazing poet who like collects metadata and all the descriptions of uh, just, paintings and illustrations that depict black women. Uh, and, you know, some of these just have one line, you know, like, a, you know, slave girl in the corner, like things that like are just like, that's it, we got that and it's out. And she, you know, she took all these, um, all these like one lines and remixed them and put together this like beautiful, like 200 page uh, poem, you know, like, like, you know, Homer the Iliad and, it, it just, it, it changed a lot for me in terms of um, the power and the responsibility we have um, when we are cataloging um, people's lives. Um, and that it's, it really is, you know, so incredibly, um, uh, it's emotional too. I didn't know we were gonna get emotional about files, but we have to, that's, it's in, it's, that's how I am. Anyway, so yeah, I just, I, I want us to remember the, the humanity of, of this work. Um, how I think you have to be called to do this. I think that's a really good point because when we talk about archiving and the methodologies, it can sound very dry, but what you're actually doing is preserving a person and their body of work. And then, you know, for someone like myself and Julie Joyce, uh, as curators of, Kim show, but also by extension, um, reframing or possibly representing Eileen Gray. Uh, it's that's that's something that we focus on. Is this is a partly historical show, but it's also a contemporary show, and we also have the long view. I mean, we're making a cap of this exhibition, in large part because Kim has yet to have a monograph, and we feel like it's really important especially in light of the fact that we, um, you know, we're at a moment in our culture where we actually are acknowledging how much has been omitted in the larger historical narrative. Um, I think Julie and I are very well aware and very conscious of the fact that what we do is actually contributing to this arc of history that 
you know, when we're long gone, it'll still be there in some capacity, which actually brings me to what Meg is talking about in the chat um, early on. She was talking about how a lot of academic libraries, and, and this comes down to space, they constantly have to purge. Art centers libraries are constantly having to purge because of the limitation of space. And the purging is um, based on, you know, really how much um, action a book is going to get. Right. If something isn't checked out for many, many years, then that becomes the measuring stick of, well, it's not significant enough at this time. It's not as in demand, so we need to get rid of it. And that becomes the problem, I think. Um, you know, things are not in demand because, because what we consider is culturally relevant, built on our own assumptions, keeps floating in and out of popularity. And it, this is the issue. I feel like like why does Eileen Gray get disappeared in some ways through histories because she wasn't seen as being significant or in demand enough. And yet here we are trying to make sure she's understood as somebody who's significant. There's a difference between demand and significance. And how do like, how does that play out in the way we archive? Especially Eliza for a large institution like the Smithsonian, which is really you know, the role of, of, of uh, recording United States history in some respect. Yeah, it is very challenging. Um, for us, somebody has to have had some cultural traction, tra some traction in the culture. It could have been in 1938, you know, and, and then the greatest thing are the people that had traction like that, and then they disappeared off the face of the history of art. But we have their papers, and then we're part of that revisionist history where people come back and say, oh, you know, here's a great X, like a great woman abstract expressionist painter, like who would have thought? Except that those papers exist. Uh, but they have to have some, the thing that's difficult for me that I think about a lot is that they, the, the artists, the, the people that we collect, we, and we collect gallery records, with papers of art historians, art critics, art dealers, collectors, the whole ecology of the American art world. They have to have had a moment, a connection embedded in a network. Often the people's papers that we have, no one has heard of them. They're not household names, but they, in their network, you know, they had uh, significant figures that wrote to them or they were, witnesses to a, an event that was significant, or they are representative of a moment in American art history that should be preserved, uh, or they have a story to tell. And you know, some, we also have a really active oral history program that can, it goes hand in hand with our collecting of manuscript material or, or born digital now records. And that uh, if, it's another way of gathering a primary source when written records don't exist or a way to fill in the gap. And we haven't, we, have, we haven't done this very often, but we do talk about actually recording an oral history interview with the papers too, so that you, know, you have kind of this experience and it is a profound human experience to go through someone's papers with them because they discover things about themselves that they had forgotten, or they're, you know, they're just surprised by encountering themselves in this way, because it's a letter they hadn't seen in 30 years. Or, you know, there's a it, it's a very powerful experience, but it really is, you know, it's just kind of the essence of the archive is, is about human relationships. And those are what's revealed in these papers. And often very um hard to capture as you as you know as you say you know I, I would add, um that i think you know when we're looking at like larger like federal institutions they play such an important role for giving us like a snapshot of like all the the major um cultural shifts happening for us but I, this is my plug for the community archives or like the, um, or for the like kind of smaller collections. And, and hopefully, I mean, I know there are some like funds out there that support, you know, communities being able to build out 
um, you know, smaller repositories where they still have, you know, facilities that are, um, you know, safe for all the materials. But I don't think, um, I think us expecting larger institutions to capture everything isn't fair. I think that there are those who are on the ground who are doing this work, um, cataloging specific um, cultural moments or historical moments, um, or even their own friends' art scenes, you know, um, I think we have some responsibility in, in, in caring for our own histories. Um, and then we get to make the choice if that's something that should live, you know, in our collective memory later. Um, and valuing those types of collections as just as important um, as some of the state or city um, uh, special collections or repositories that we have, like through the library systems and, um, you know, maybe state museums, things like that. So I look at this as like a, a larger ecosystem. So, you know, um, that, that we all kind of play a really important role in making sure that we're kind of covering all of our bases. The, the downfall, I think, is that um, local communities don't always have as many resources to collect. I don't know that there's this, um, enough education and training around making sure um, that we're still aligning with like kind of traditional archive, you know, archiving protocol so that, you know, things are protected over time. But yeah, that's just where my heart is. I think I, 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 I think if we're expecting these larger spaces to do every there, it's, it's, it's impossible. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in the integration of all three of, I think what, what all three panelists kind of represent. Um, we actually need healthy, um, all three of those pillars should be really healthy and, and you know, juicy. Yeah. I think this, you hit on what Suzanne talked about as the citizen archivist. And one thing I wanted to ask is there is a lot of, of preserving that does happen on so many different levels, but um, before we started the panel, um, we were, I think Suzanne, you were talking about how to democratize the archives or democratize special collections. Like Liza, you're talking about these things that the Smithsonian has that people don't even know about, but how do we make it accessible and make people aware enough to go and seek them out so that we can show a, a, a more um, inclusive historical narrative? How do we make the collections visible? Is that mm -hmm. the question? Um, well, through um, EAD finding aids uh, that are searchable online for, we have about 6,000 collections. And I think the greatest tool is really a finding aid for a manuscript collection. Also, we have a very uh, pretty robust digitization program. We have about 250 fully digitized collections, 3 million digital files that are available through our website. We have a digitization on demand service too. Uh, we have a very friendly reference staff. So um, don't be intimidated. <laughs> Contact us, email us, call us. We're here, we're here through the pandemic. And you know, uh, our head of reference has even set up Zoom calls as you know, Zoom conferences with people who are searching for things. We are closed still to the public, but we're, we're getting uh, more and more creative about how to remotely serve the public. Um, I think you know, our staff is, is in, during this pandemic era uh, have been very uh, involved in a lot of back burner projects like, um, conscious description and looking at all of our subject catalog cataloging and um, trying to uh, bring out terms that are uh, that, that people will use to search uh, in that way making the collections more legible I think to someone searching online um, you know so much, of what we have, I mean, not only digitized, we have a lot of things that have been transcribed through the Smithsonian Transcription Center, like tens of thousands of pages of letters and diaries that are not only findable, but word searchable um, that have been written in cursive. Like, let's not even talk about the students today who can't read cursive, I've, I'm, I can't go there, but 
we do we do have ways of making these things accessible, but we really try uh, to have um, in depth uh, descriptions of collections in terms of folder level access to larger collections, and that I think that's like the our best effort is to have that out there and have it searchable and you can, you know, Google picks it up and you can get to it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, metadata is of the utmost importance in making sure, you know, these collections are findable um, and it's metadata is not sexy <laughs> and it takes time. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the things that we have to explain to people over and over. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we can't stress that enough. Uh, we do try to um, uh, engage in like public outreach as well um, in order to make people aware of um, items that they may not be aware of. Um, at LAPL, we, we're, we're pretty active on Instagram. Um, you can follow us at LAPL underscore special collections. Um, and we, um, you know, put up a weekly post um, of an item in the collection that we may have come across that, um, that delighted us that, or, or that a patron had requested that we had not necessarily been aware about. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we participate in um, things like the Archives Bazaar um, here in Los Angeles um, that's hosted by USC that happens every year. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage it. You're going to learn about pretty much almost all of the different archives in LA that have collections related to LA. Um, so, oh, thank you, Larry. Ari. <laughs> thank um. you, Matt. I would agree with that. I think um, we've also part of um, part of the work that I do with Jayla Edmonds project was definitely pre pandemic, but you know we host a lot of like cultural events, um, community events and have partnered with uh, LA library quite a bit. Um, also a project with, with Kim um, and almost like introducing people to like uh, helping to make sure these archives feel alive. Um, and introducing um, a lot of like, you know, maybe hidden facts in a way that makes people feel like um, uh, like that, that, that these things, that these are people, you know, and that, that there's information there um, that can actually help unlock things for our lives. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the programs are pretty intergenerational. So we try to find like touch points to reach folks at different points in their life. Um, and I think there's something important about uh, feeling like you can still kind of touch the archives. Like we're not bringing like really rare materials, but I think now that so much of, so many of our collections are digitized, I just think that it's important to bring it forward and, and ask people to participate with it and think about how it, how it, how it touches them. Um, yeah. And like, there's just stories, people love stories. I'm not being a very good promoter because we just launched a podcast, Articulated, Dispatches from the Archives of American Art. Here's our first swag. But it's, it draws on the oral history collection that goes back to 1958. And the first four episodes are about WPA and New Deal art because we interviewed about 300 people who were active in the WPA in the early 60s. But these uh, podcasts also bring in contemporary voices, scholars, art, figures of uh, making that material from the past relevant today. Our next two uh, or three, I guess the next two episodes are about, about art activism during the, uh, the peak of the AIDS epidemic in the early 80s. And so uh, those are gonna be really good. We have a really active social media working group, very creative, uh, publish a peer reviewed journal that comes out twice a year. Um, we have a really good blog. <laughs> So I think we should do some collaborative, collaborative work um, online with various ways of communicating the, the depths of our resources and, and you know, what things talk to each other. I like that. Okay, I have one quick thing and then I know we have questions, but 
I also think that sometimes it's like it's timing, like sometimes the culture isn't ready to hear certain stories or, or hear about or be reminded about certain artists. And sometimes uh, like I know I'm bringing up spirits so much when we're talking about archives, but it's just happening. I'm, I'm gonna have to let it go, but uh, let it flow. But, you know, I, I do think that um, the, the power of these repositories and these libraries is to hold it until the culture is ready. Um, ready to remember again. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just think there's something so magical about that. I think that's a really good point about archives is that uh, it's not for the moment, but it's also for the, the future when things become more significant or, um, you know, it, it helps us to remember that we might have missed something so that people can go back to it. Yeah, and I think that's an important point too, because, you know, Eileen Gray herself, she, like she started really having a moment, you know, last year, the year before, I don't know, what year is it? Uh, COVID. Um, so she, like, like 2019, I started researching her and, and the house was getting redone and all of these articles were starting to come out on her and they were correcting the history. So the history on her had been written, but it was written incorrectly because the archives were really bad and because they hadn't really discovered whatever, it's a little complex history, but you know, it was fascinating to me to think of a book, a published book as being wrong. And these other scholars came in and they were like, no, 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 throw that book out. That's a terrible book. Like, even the books, like the books that we used for the picture for this, like people are like, no, that's the bad book. That's, and that's the bad book. But it's because those people who were writing those books at that time didn't have good information to work from. They were working from what they had. And so this is, again, this sort of like impetus to really dive into like archiving as not just a sort of like, this is, this is it, this is the be all end all, but it's also a collective effort to create a full picture of not just a person, not just a city, not just a movement, but like to really flesh out what was happening with a, a really complex view. So I totally, I totally get that. And she really is having her, her kind of moment now too. The point Kim, it's archives are always alive because the next generation is bringing to that material different questions they're in a different place and so they're being read again and and so you know history is continually evolving hopefully perfecting but not always so it's it's always it's always about the moment that it's that these uh and that they are evidence of the past but they're um you know, they're mediated through the present and that's what it's ever changing. It's fascinating, yeah. I think, that you can have a, a collection that continues to feed scholarship over and over and over again. And that's, you know, that's, that's what history's about. Yeah, I think about how curators are like these like translators between present and our, and our past, same with scholars. They can kind of live between both worlds. And, and it's a big responsibility. I don't know that folks who are coming out of like art history, you know, getting their art history degrees are thinking about um, what it means to have to live in both spaces. And, and, um, and I keep bringing up responsibility, but the, the importance um, of that role uh, helps us to define the way we see ourselves in each cultural moment in our time. So um, yeah. Ariana, I actually had a question for you because you provide this um, really individual and personal microscopic level of archiving. Um, I was noticing in the, just doing research for introducing everybody um, that your, it was your great, great grandfather and his legacy. And why was it that it took you coming up through the family to get to the point of establishing this archive? Like, how is it that your father's generation didn't, you know, create that first? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's time. 
you know, I something that I share quite a bit when like we're doing interviews or talking about our archive is that um, they did everything. They did the stuff like um, my work is in many ways is like much more public. Like I'm kind of like the mouthpiece of this work, but you know, I we have like correspondence between you know aunts and uncles, you know, petitioning the elders to make sure that the papers get digitized. They're like, there's this new new technology micro microfiche. We should try it, you know. So like, I have all those letters. Um, you know, and they're like, you know, talk to your lawyer to see, you know, if, if it's a good bit of it. They're like, talk about how much it costs. And, you know, so um, while I feel really grateful that I get to be um, the steward now, um, the work was happening behind the scenes, you know, and I don't do it by myself. They knew to keep um, these materials and keep it in scrapbooks and, you know, consulted with librarians and, and archivists about the best way to preserve um, you know, our family has a, a rare books library and we have a, a library, a, a, a rare books collection. And, you know, they knew how to keep it. Everything still looks great. And we've had folks come by the house to check it. And so, you know, I, I, I think a big part of it is um, because of so much uh, um, social upheaval and us having to reckon with um, our history in America. I think that's why people are interested in this archive now. And I think that um, I think that it's an opening in history that's asking us to reflect. And I think that we don't always get those portals, you know? So uh, I do feel special, but I think that it would have been someone else in my family if it was the right time. Um, uh, I ha we just had one other thing that I was going to ask. I don't even know if it's important at this point, but um, if anybody has any questions, they could always just hand raise and then um, pipe in as well. Um, but this goes to a nuts and bolts issue, which is um, for the individual artist who's trying to be good about keeping records and archives on point. I know that we've covered some of those elements, but in terms of what is regarded as a low priority material at the moment, like how does one house that? Obviously, if something you consider as high priority in your um, in your archives, we take special pains, especially if, in like what Ariane is saying, when you're limited with resources and funding, I'm sure you pay a lot of attention to those things, but what we might consider low priority now, which may have greater significance later, like how, how does an individual end up one categorizing that, but also saving it. I, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, the one archive, which is, you know, it's, it's managed independently um, by the foundation and also at USC, which is like one of the largest LGBTQ um, collections, I think, in the country. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to misquote them, but, you know, the founders just had to keep things um, uh, in their home. And I think, especially for some of the histories that may not be, or the, and I mean, this is art, these are like magazines, it's like all kinds of things in our collections, powerful. And, um, and probably, you know, materials that you're probably using for the exhibition that you're doing, uh, Liza, I'm sure, you know, without, um, that forethought to say, you know, the world may not think this is important, but I know it's going to mean something later. Um, some of it does does have to be a little more bootstrapped, or at least that has been my experience. And and and, um, yeah, I think there should be more funding um, that should be focused on this. And I don't know who to talk to, but I'm putting it out there. I think it's very very valuable, and you can't always keep it in your house, you know. Yeah, I love the idea of shared responsibility among institutions for some of these areas. We, we had a big discussion about mail art a couple of years ago because mail art collections can be so voluminous and they document networks in the art world, you know, in a really wonderful way, but uh, we can't take it all. And there are a number of other institutions that have you know, specialized collections, or they have a little concentration in that. 
And so, you know, more and more we are working with institutions that have like collections to say, well, we have this, we have these five mail art collections, but here's another one. And, uh, you know, maybe you could take this one or, or we can't take the rest of this one because there's a hundred linear feet of it kind of thing. So um, together we might be able to preserve a larger um, footprint, let's say, for the male art movement because it's a very large footprint. <laughs> so maybe there's ways of thinking about archives creatively like that in terms of uh, not shared, not so much shared collections, because I'm still very old school about shared collections, but uh, dealing around topics together to ensure that we have a larger um, presence for it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in a similar fashion, um, we'll receive donations that maybe don't fall under our collection scope, but we know another archive will find it important. Um, and we'll offer it to them and send it to them. Um, so yeah, it's sort of collaborated that way. Well, does anybody else have any questions or comments pertaining to our panel today? Uh, and have for our panelists, any last words before we end our session this evening? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful. Thank, thank you, everybody. You so thank you, Liza, for staying up late. <laughs> see? It's dark out here, here on the East Coast. <laughs> well, man. And Ari, wherever you're zooming in from. <laughs> it's late here too, but I'm but I'm happy to be here. Yay, thank you. And Suzanne, thank you. And thank you, Christina, for setting everything up. And this was so great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. And again, you can email us if you would like to come and see the exhibition. And our next panel on artist contracts is uh, in November. And I, I've put the link in the chat if you'd like to see it. But thank you all for coming today and taking the time to listen to this really great conversation.